There's no question about it. When I urge people to consider telling the truth, I don't like to fool them as to what they're getting into. And the personal costs are very large, as well as the, uh, as the organizational costs. In fact, one guy did a study of this, I've forgotten who it was now, who said that, I, I have his, his book, it's quite good really, a study of whistleblowers, that says that marriages last on an average of 18 months from the start of this. That they mostly go because the spouse didn't sign on to this process. Uh, the loss of income, uh, the moving, losing all our friends, moving to another part of the country, children's education being interrupted. If you saw the movie The Insider, you remember the, the guy's about a real story, tobacco whistleblower, <clears throat> guy's wife leaves him at some point, just not a bad person. She just says, this isn't what I married you for. And that's very common. I was very lucky on this. My, our trial brought my wife and I together strongly, which was almost unique. Almost every anti-war trial broke up marriages. Just too much strain. But the, uh, uh, the social aspect of that in general, it also goes beyond that. I was thinking it's losing. We've all, most of us here have had the experience one way or another, even the ones who don't think of themselves as whistleblowers, as doing something you think of as right, the right thing to do. You thought at the time it was right, you think now that it was right, and yet you, we share, and I'll just speak for myself, but I think there'll be a lot of resonance here. We share the experience of having done something right, as you said, just seemed in the job, you know, the right thing to do, for the interests of the organization, the interests of the country, and so on. And not only having pressure on our jobs from our being punished, by people who were in the line of being blamed and sort of felt they had something to lose from this. But being ostracized, who was it? Uh, Jeffrey wasn't it who said, alone is the world here. Word here, having people fall away, partly for prudence. You know, they're gonna, uh, they don't wanna be tired with this. They're gonna get in trouble too. But also the feeling of being, of losing the respect of people you, at least previously, respected and you wanted their respect that's a very isolating feeling and a very unnerving feeling you're sort of suspended out there in the air you don't feel ashamed of what you did quite the contrary but people you've been your peer group your reference group feels you should be ashamed you've done something shameful you've not only uh, gone against the team and endangered them and their budget and their relations with their bosses uh, and everything, and your boss certainly feels that, uh, and the, the political opposition, it might be. Uh, but you've let them down. It's a kind of betrayal. Uh, and they don't, they don't approve it uh, anymore. And in effect, you're challenged to yourself to say, well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you one experience I've had that's you know, one step up above that. The respect I, I'll speak for myself, the respect I had, un, unblemished, for my RAND colleagues, whom I admired greatly, and liked all of them essentially, was greatly diminished by their reaction, not by the way to the Pentagon Papers, I'll come back to that, but a year earlier when six of us wrote a letter, speaking of letters here, a letter to the New York Times expressing a view that was then held by about 70% of the American people, that we should be out of Vietnam in a year, we should set a deadline and get out in a year, and it went out from RAND. Out of 500 professionals, we got 75 long memos denouncing us. But they didn't denounce us on the grounds that, uh, in other words, one out of five almost professionals denounced us, took the trouble, and long memos. Not one of them said what I expected they'd say. You have endangered Rand and our mission for the security. You know, you're hurting this wonderful institution. Um, you are against the war that needs to be product, uh, you know, pursued and so forth. We disagree with you. On the contrary, virtually everyone started by saying, I'm as much against the war as you are. What? Which was true on the whole. We, we knew we weren't in an, in an, if this was 1969, we weren't in an institution that was supporting the war. We were working for the DOD, but they weren't supporting it. Nobody in the Pentagon was supporting the war, uh, you could speak of, very, very few exceptions. The line in every case was, as one person put it literally, you have a right to put your job on the line, you do not have a right to put my job on the line. 
and budgets. What right had you to risk our budget in Congress, our jobs? And as one vice president said, whom I previously admired, he said, if your letter, he said this to another guy of uh, the six of us, if your letter loses one RAND secretary her job by a budget cut, you didn't have a right to do this. And my reaction at first was shock, and I said, uh, uh, that man should have nothing to do with issues of war and peace. That's what we're working on here. We're trying, rightly or wrongly, we're trying to shorten a war. And you're talking about a secretary losing her job? Uh, what kind of proportion is that? The point being that over the process of this, well before the Pentagon Papers, I was losing something very important to me, my respect for my RAND colleagues. And that was part of my identity. We were honest. We told the Air Force the truth. We told them that the B-70 and the B-1 were not necessary and that the Polaris, the Navy's Polaris, was a good deterrent weapon. We told the truth that made LeMay furious. To the boss, we told the truth within channels. But the idea, they all felt they'd lose their jobs if they told the public the truth? You know, all this? Uh, are they really as courageous as I've been thinking? And so forth. That's an important thing to lose, is to lose your respect for these other people for the very reason that they are, for bad reasons, losing sympathy with you and losing... I don't, has anybody else had that feeling, uh, by any means? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's a bad thing to lose. I was a RAND person. That was part of my identity. Um, I'm unhappy what the Marines have been doing in, uh, in Iraq, by the way. I, I retained my feeling of identity as a Marine uh, for a long time, and I still do, but uh, they're sent to fight a bad war in a large part by bad means, and I don't like that. Well, on the, uh, I was two years ago given a, an award in Germany for whistleblowing uh, by the German Federation of Scientists and a legal group, uh, ILANA, International Lawyers. So a judge of the, of the German Supreme Court was uh, going to hand me the award in Berlin two years ago. They give it every two years, and I'm going to go next week to be a keynote speaker while they give it to someone else, um, a couple, a German and some other people. And so as we waited to go downstairs, uh, I said to the judge, but it was called a whistleblower price, you know, something prize. I said, by the way, what is the German word for whistleblower? So he said, there is no German word for whistleblower. I said, oh, how, how good to be in a country that doesn't need a word for whistleblower. Well, what's the closest, maybe some of you know, <laughs> some of you know a word. So uh, I said, what's the, uh, what's the closest? There were three judges standing up here. He was the Supreme Court and there were a couple lower ones. I said, what's the closest word you could come to in German? He thought for a minute, he said, Freiter, traitor. I said, uh, hmm, uh, maybe, do you have another word? Uh, <laughs> give, me a, give me a second choice here, you know. So, so. He said, uh, Petzer. They all agreed, yeah, Petzer, tattletale. I said, well, that's pretty close to English uh, in the, uh, and everywhere else. By the way, I don't think there is another language that I've found that has a word for whistleblower. The, the idea is getting around, and they call it whistleblower in India and Japan and various other places. Uh, going back to Sir Robert Peel's Metropolitan Police, who were armed with whistles. Somebody said the other day, who was it, who said I was a lifeguard? You? He said, now there's a whistle. He said I had a whistle around my neck. We should be lifeguards, because that's what we are. But um, the price we're talking about here is so great. I was at one conference of, mainly, maybe some of you were at that, somebody, maybe five years ago in Washington of mainly whistleblower lawyers. They do exist. And the consensus at that conference was summed up by one of them, and they sort of all agreed. I tell people, they said, who come into my office, don't do it. Don't do it. The price is too great. You'll lose, you know, you're, it's not worth it. Even if you get a monetary reward, it's not worth it, and so forth. And I uh, really took offense at that, because there's a yes and no aspect to that. If it's just a matter of showing a cost overrun, or maybe having the rules obeyed, uh, certain, you know, not, that don't involve life and death, as in your case, think twice and three times and four times about whether it's worth upholding that principle, because the personal price is very likely to be 
too great. But where lives are involved, which is very, very often the case, and we're called national security whistleblowers here. Now I'm among people, and I'm so happy about it, who have spent your lives thinking about life and death matters and ultimate constitutional matters of civil liberties and so forth, then the price will also be very high. In fact, not necessarily a lot higher, whether it's a, a small whistle or a big whistle, the price can be about the same, but it's large. But where a lot of lives are at stake, of course they should consider paying a personal price and uh, you know, giving up even paying a very, very high price. Um, one guy wrote a book on this subject, wanted me to write a, a preface for it, named Alford. Have any of you seen that book? The On Whistleblowing, A-L-F-O-R-D. And he sent it to me, you saw, uh, to write it, I said, gee, I don't agree with this at all, because his theme was that he had lined up the, the mechanisms that they have for retaliation and the prices people had paid. He'd talked to encounter groups of whistleblowers, who I think were rather unrepresentative, I'll tell you why. Uh, and enlisted the real price they'd paid of marriages, lost lives, and effects. And, so and he said, his conclusion was, they all regretted having done it. Now I said, listen, I've met, I've, I've made out of, in the last 20 years, I've gone out of my way to meet whistleblowers uh, because I feel such a fraternal feeling toward them. I mean, you know, we face the same kind of thing and I admire them, they're my heroes, they give me further strength and so forth. I've met a lot of them. I said, I've never met one who said he regretted doing it or she regretted doing it, although they did pay terrible prices in many cases. I'm a really rare exception that came out pretty well. Uh, on the, they didn't get me the way they intended, uh, but there was a lot of luck involved in that. Most people paid a very good price, but I had never met one who said, I'm sorry I did it. Some say I might have done it a little differently or something. But uh, so, and he couldn't believe that in a way, and I just insisted that he take my name out of, he, he had actually quoted me to that effect. And, um, uh, so you have this social notion. By the way, in Germany, I'm going to point out to them that this social idea of the attitude toward whistleblowers goes back a ways. I found a German text uh, written in the 1920s that um, says this. Um, How often during the war, First World War, did we hear the complaint that our people were so little able to be silent? I think the word is schweigenders. Anybody here speak German? How hard it made, this made it to withhold even important secrets from the knowledge of our enemies. But ask yourself this question. What before the war did German education do to teach the individual silence? Even in school, sad to say, wasn't the little informer sometimes preferred to his more silent schoolmates? Was, uh, was any effort whatever made to represent discretion as a manly and precious virtue? No, and he goes on to say for a while, he says, this is the place to say that a teacher, for instance, must on principle not try to obtain knowledge of silly children's tricks by cultivating loathsome tattletales. A boy who snitches on his comrade practices treason and thus betrays a mentality which is the exact equivalent of treason to one's country. Ferrat, Landis Ferrata. So uh, that w that's Hitler in Mein Kampf, um, chapter, in chapter two, volume two. So it goes, and the man who wrote that, he wrote it in prison, but that was a kind of success story. He later got 32% of the vote, showing a certain resonance with his beliefs and became chancellor of Germany and world famous. Um, so so it's, but that's, it's not only Germany, that's the point. But one other German thing, I'm saying that the people then who do face, uh, the people I tell they should be considering strongly uh, telling the truth that is unauthorized, that their bosses don't want, which is told, which is always dangerous, unless you're telling a higher boss, a president or something, in which case it's a high risk strategy, but it can be rewarding. But to go beyond the president or outside the organization is not just high risk, it's fatal if you're discovered. 
and in my case, 7,000 pages of top secret documents, I had to assume that I could not, I would be discovered. In fact, I knew the FBI knew that I had done it because my former wife had told her stepmother and the stepmother told the FBI a year before the papers came out, by the way. So for the FBI people here, it's kind of an interesting story. So, um, and the reason they didn't go after me then and stop the Pentagon Papers was that my former wife uh, had told them that I'd given it to Fulbright. And so they wrote memos, which I have from my trial. Uh, this has the potential to embarrass the Bureau, you know, if we pursue it. And so it went on. It's no, so I, I didn't go on and commit murders. I went on and I released the documents a year later. And I've never understood how the FBI explained that one to the White House, you know, why they had known but they hadn't pursued it. But in these cases where in national security whistleblower, where what we're dealing with is, they say, not just violations of rules, even important ones, but as in the nuclear industry, as in tobacco, but even on a big, well, not bigger than tobacco, nothing's bigger than that. But on the national security level, you're talking about lives, big lives at stake, and also ongoing catastrophes. It was the case in 64, 65, and 66, 67, 68, that the Pentagon was filled with people, had many people who felt we were heading into a um, hopeless war, a costly war, an unnecessary war, an unendable war. It was not filled with the neocons. In fact, there was no real corresponding person to the Wolfowitz who says we're going to be treated with greet, uh, sweets and flowers. Nobody was saying that. The military wanted to go in, but on a big scale. That's like this one, too, where they wanted more troops in this one. Just as in this case, there were many people who knew we were being lied into a wrongful and unnecessary war. But none of them told Congress or the press, and that includes me. As I've told, and I won't take the time to go into it now, my first day as a full-time employee in the Pentagon, uh, after being a consultant at a high level, higher than top secret, for several years, but when I was hired, it happened to be by coincidence on August uh, 6th, I'm sorry, August 4th, let me get this right, well, how could I forget this, August 4th, 1964, the night of the Tonkin Gulf raid, the attack on our destroyers that did not take place. But since it was supposedly the second attack in three days, it showed a definite pattern of intention that had to be responded to. So I hear the president say that night, and I was sleeping in the Pentagon that night, or not sleeping actually, uh, monitoring the raids. Uh, as a GS-18 assistant to the assistant secretary, uh, I hear the president say, we have unequivocal evidence of a second, first one had been on Sunday, a second deliberate attack, unprovoked, on our destroyers in international waters on a routine patrol in the Tonkin Gulf. We are responding fitly, but we seek no wider war. On my first day, then in the Pentagon, I knew that the president was talking about 64 sorties, the first beginning of the bombing that ultimately led to 7.2 million tons of bombs on Vietnam, or almost four World War II's, and this was the first night of it. And I knew that every one of those statements was a lie. Now, what should I have done? I've asked audiences that, and I can ask you that, and I won't wait for answers right now because I don't have enough time. But think about it. What should I have done? I really don't get any answers back, and that's inappropriate. Uh, that is appropriate, I mean. I mean, I did what everybody else who knew that, and there were hundreds of people who knew all that. Uh, we did our jobs. We kept our mouths shut to Congress. We watched Congress vote on a Tonkin Gulf resolution uh, on the basis of these lies, uh, we, saw, we watched a day earlier. These actually were closed hearings, so not everybody got to watch them, but I saw the transcripts, nightly transcripts of these classified hearings, top secret hearings between McNamara and the Joint Committees of Congress, filled with lies, which I knew were lies. I didn't tell Congress. I didn't think of it. And one reason for not thinking of it, by the way, was that he was in a campaign against Goldwater. Goldwater was calling for a war, uh, what's the use of exposing the president if you didn't believe in this war? What, to improve the vote for Goldwater? You know, that, that didn't seem, didn't occur to anybody. 
So on the day of election day, I was representing the Defense Department with my boss, John McNaughton, a Harvard Law professor, while the public was voting in unprecedented landslide on a referendum, a foreign policy referendum, because the war had been the number one issue. No wider war versus go in there and win it, Goldwater. Public voted against Goldwater in an unprecedented landslide, and while they were doing that, we didn't have time to vote. We were preparing the bombing plans to carry out Goldwater's program, knowing that he would be beaten. Didn't occur to any of us to ask, are we doing something unconstitutional here, you know, or do we have a right to be doing this? Do we have a right to keep this secret from the public, which was critical? I, I don't think, I'm sure no one asked himself that, and they were all men asked himself that at the time. Certainly I didn't. So we did. Looking back on it, uh, there's something to regret there. Uh, not to feel too guilty, I, in, in a certain sense, I can say, look, I wasn't any worse than anybody else. We didn't think of it. Everybody acted the same. If we acted differently, we were out of the game. We would have no further attempt, ability to use our clearances and use our access, such as it was, mine to the McNamara, to, um, to bring about better, better decisions. And after all, what difference will it would make? Actually, I believe that if I had emptied my safe, which of course I didn't dream of doing, emptied my safe and given it to the Senate before the Tonkin Gulf or after, there were six months to go before the heavy bombing started, there would not have been a war. I was one of perhaps hundreds of individuals who could have done that. You don't have to be McNamara, of course he could have done it, with documents. Any one of us, even McNamara, going public with this without documents, I think would not have done the job. Just like Powell, without documents, but denouncing what he just said, I think would not be enough. But Powell had a safe full of documents, proving how thin the evidence was for what he was saying was unequivocal evidence, which was a lie. He probably believed there were WMDs there. He could not have known, Powell could not have believed that when he said, uh, these are not beliefs, these are not assertions, these are facts, we know where they are, here's where they are, here's where we're gonna hit, as Rumsfeld said, and that was a lie. He was lying us into war. Even if he falsely believed that there were WMDs there for which we didn't have evidence. Just as on August 4th, I knew my bosses believed there had been an attack. They just knew they didn't have any evidence for it, good evidence. And it was days before they realized that there had been no attack within a few days. But that night they believed it, but they lied when they said unequivocal, unprovoked, international waters, routine patrol. Each of those, I said, was a known lie to them. Now, if you can't stand government lying in the national security field, I couldn't have been in that job two weeks, uh, let alone the 10 years that I spent. Some people thought I put out the Pentagon Papers because I was shocked, shocked to find lies in these things. The issue was what the lies were about and the policy they were serving. As now, there have to be a thousand officers in the Army who know that when Shinseki said in 2002, it will take several hundred thousand troops there to occupy this country. And Wolfowitz, his boss, said, that's nonsense, that's off the wall, that's ridiculous. The army people here will know. Shinseki didn't pull that number out of his head. He had to have a stack of classified studies this high, just as there were at the State Department, saying, here's what you need them for. Here's the dumps that have to be uh, secured. Here's, what you have, here's how many people you need per city, per population, so forth. Several hundred thousand. When the president said, I'm sending everything that Franks and so forth has sent, or wanted, has asked for, and he's still saying that. If they ask for it, I'll send it. I, have, I haven't sent it, therefore they haven't asked for it, as you know, or, or I would have sent it. That's a lie, I'm certain. How do I know that? Well, there was a day in uh, July, 1965, when I had written the speech for McNamara to give, describing that we were sending over another 100,000 troops on top of the 100,000 we had, 75,000 we had. We were sending another 100,000. 
We were not mobilizing the reserves, which the JCS had demanded and asked for, but they decided against that. But we were sending 100,000 with the understanding that another 100,000 would be sent shortly and taking us up basically to 300,000. But the Joint Chiefs were asking for 500 to 700,000, and Wheeler had mentioned the possibility of a million troops. Okay. And I believe, by the way, the situation would look very similar today. If they needed several hundred thousand troops two years ago, things have gone distinctly downhill. 700, 200, 300,000 troops would not do the job now. If they're being asked, and they are, what does it take to do the job, to stay the course, to win, as they talk about it, Rumsfeld says we have a victory strategy. Is there a general or colonel in the Pentagon who's telling Rumsfeld, sir, we can give you victory with 140,000 troops? Zero. Impossible. So how many? Hillary asked for 40,000 more. Kerry, 40,000, are you kidding? So what they're saying is they're showing their studies and say, well, we could do a lot more for you, whether we could win or not. I, I doubt if any of them are giving him win strategies. With 300, 400, 500,000 troops. Rand did a study that showed 500,000 troops I read and so forth. So anyway, on this day, which was, I'd written this speech from McNamara saying, here's why we're sending 100,000 troops, another more. It's against China. I pulled that one out of the air. Uh, now we're fighting China. I mean, you can't, you can't explain another uh, 300,000 troops to fight Ho Chi Minh. So I said, China is testing us, uh, you know, and so forth. We, will we be up to this, you know, and so forth. I'm not proud to read what I wrote then, <coughs> but it had to be done. The president decides not to give that speech, I'm told. Wrote that on July 22nd. On July 28th, in a routine press conference, of which the main purpose is to announce, I believe, uh, Goldberg was going to the UN from the Supreme Court. That was the big news. And by the way, so we're sending some more troops. We gathered around the TV, you know, like your Jeffrey's TV here. We gathered around the TV to see, how, I wanted to see what words of mine, will he talk about China and we do this. Um, the president would use. So all the aides now were in, in McNaughton's office in ISA in the Pentagon, watching the speech. And the president says, uh, I am sending what Westmoreland has requested. Uh, we're, sent, we're going up from 75,000 to 125,000 immediately. More will be sent if needed and if requested. So we all jumped. And I said, I'd written the other speech, and I said, well, of which none was used. And I said, 50,000, 75 to 125? Has he changed the order? It was possible. McNaughton said, you better find out. So I run down to the joint staff, uh, talk to the guy in charge of personnel, and I said, general, <clears throat> and I said, have they changed the order as to what's going over there? He said, no, no, 100,000 is on the way. And 100,000 were there by early November, 200,000 by the end of the year, 300,000 the next year as proposed, 500,000 a little later, all on track. Uh, the public was lied to at every step of the way. And actually, the chief of staff of the army on that day, and I talked to his deputy about this, it was, uh, it was a story was out, and I had it confirmed by Bruce Palmer, uh, General Bruce Palmer, who was the deputy to Harold Johnson, chief of staff of the army, later deputy to Westmoreland. He failed to be chief of staff. And Palmer told me that Harold Johnson had told him when he saw that speech and that the public was being lied into the impression that this was going to be a small, containable war and only needed another 50,000, like Hillary's 40,000, uh, he asked for his car to go to the White House. And on the way to the White House, he removed the four stars from each of his shoulders. He held them in his hand and they stopped in front of the White House. And then he told the, white, the driver, wait here a minute. He sat in the car for a few minutes, and then he said, take me back. And he put the stars back on. And he later told Palmer, he said, it was the most shameful act of my life. I should have resigned then. The public needed to know, even through mobilization as well, that we had asked for mobilization, and that we had asked for 100,000 plus another 100,000 plus another. 
they were being lied into or we wouldn't have public support and he felt it was unconstitutional. A word that was never, I never heard used as a civilian in the Pentagon. Both Palm, Palmer told me that he and his boss thought it was unconstitutional to be doing this. Constitution? You know, we worked for the president. It never occurred to us that that applied to us uh, or, the, or the First Amendment or anything. So the war gets going and so forth. Uh, I could go on then more as to how my mind changed, but I, I won't take the time. I don't have the time here. But let me mention the attitude. As I've told many people then that I'm trying to encourage to be whistleblowers uh, in the press. Don't do what I did. Don't wait till the war has started. Don't wait till the bombs have fallen. Don't wait till thousands more have died before you go to the press and Congress. Congress and the press, another lesson I learned, I made a mistake of waiting 22 months for Congress people to carry out their promises to put out the Pentagon Papers before they decided not to. Fulbright, Matthias, McCloskey, McGovern, all said initially, yes, I'll do it, fine, great, no problem. And within a week or so said, I don't think so. So I lo lost 22 months that way. I should have gone to the press initially. But I'm thinking much more about 45. I say, do what I wish I had done in 1964-65. Take these documents knowing I was eventually indicted for a 115 year possible sentence. Uh, I'd be getting out in 2008 with good behavior. And, but knowing that I'd go to prison, that's what I assumed I would do. I should have done that in 64. When the president, when the public then would have known, they still wouldn't have voted for, they wouldn't have elected Goldwater, but they wouldn't have let Johnson go to Vietnam. Uh, they, he, would have been, he would have been revealed as a liar that you had, he couldn't be impeached with the Republican, Democratic Congress, but uh, they couldn't sign that, you know, they couldn't go ahead doing this ridiculous, absurd, crazy war at, like Iraq if they knew what they were getting into instead of this salami thing. So, you see, there are occasions when the greatest uh, personal cost and organizational cost, cost to your teammates. My best friend, the president of RAND, Harry Rowan, who had been my friend and mentor for a dozen years, I knew that his mere association with me would lose him his job, and it did. Didn't end his career, he later was in charge of estimates for CIA, and so he got a job back. But for a couple of years, he didn't have a job. I didn't do that lightly. And uh, the family and all this, I told my former wife, the kids will have to go to college on their own. You know, I won't be able to help them, I'll be in prison. Is that mine? So, um, but I say this can be worthwhile, not for every kind of thing. And uh, take, going back now, there is the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, a lot of other things, your, your case. Um, think of the greatest, catastrophe that a nation, let's say, has faced yet, yet, before a big nuclear war. And that's Hitler's descent into fascism and aggression, ultimately against Russia. There was no general who was not, who wanted to go into Russia. Actually, B.H. Littlehart interviewed them later and found that a major reason they have for holding back and holding back on a coup was, yeah, was that they had children to go to college. And their children would not be in the middle class if they, you know. so uh, <laughs> instead, you know, their children got bombed and, uh, and famine and so forth. Okay, this is a poem that I'm gonna read in Germany and I'm gonna try to read it in German. Somebody's gonna coach me. By a guy named Albrecht Hosshofer, and I won't take the time to give his whole background, but he'd been in the, he'd been in the resistance against Hitler since 39. He was a high level uh, diplomat. His father was even bigger. That protected him for several years. And, uh, but eventually they caught up with him and they got him in, uh, under the July plot uh, against Hitler of 1944. <clears throat> but he was in prison then till April 23rd, two weeks before the war ended, the SS took him out to a field next to Moabit prison and shot him and six others in the back of the neck. 
he was found by his brother, who, who <coughs> knew that he'd been taken out, in this field, um, frozen body, with his hand inside his coat. And inside the hand, he was clutching 80 sonnets, uh, because he is also a poet as well as a diplomat. He'd written several verse plays and things. And this is his poem, Literal Translation, not the, the poem is, is said to be quite good in German in a, as a sonnet, rhyming and so forth. And it illustrates what somebody mentioned to me just the other day, um, uh, Bob Lifton. He said, you know, he studied a lot of trauma and w stress and so forth. He said, you know, the people who feel the most guilt are the people who have done the most to protest and to resist. And they feel guilty about what they haven't done, what they have left undone, what they didn't do in time. And um, the title of this is Schult, Guilt. I bear lightly what the court calls my guilt, to plot and to conspire. I would have been a criminal had I not taken that as my duty for my people's future. I would have been a criminal had I not taken that as my duty for my people's future. Yet I am guilty, but not the way you think. I should have recognized my duty sooner. I should more sharply have named evil as evil. Unheil, unheil. I restrained my judgment far too long. In my heart I accuse myself. I have long betrayed my conscience. I have lied to myself and lied to others. I knew early on the whole road of disaster. I gave warning, not strong and clear enough. Today I know what I was guilty of. Well, I'm very, very happy to be in this room with these people who have been telling the truth. This country needs us now. The reason I've been reading so much German stuff is I think we have a crew in the administration. This is my belief. This is what I am plagued with. You don't have to agree. I think we have a people who are not concerned about democracy and civil rights administering the necessary issues of surveillance and detention and uh, fighting the war on terror, which are very pressing challenges. But they are being addressed, I believe, by people who do not value democracy. And I believe they will use the next 9-11 as an invitation and an excuse, as they did the first 9-11 to attack Iraq and thereby make the war against terror worse or insoluble. I think they'll use the next 9-11, and I believe the plans have been laid for this. Plans, plans for, to do a number of things, an opportunity, a Patriot Act that makes the first one look like the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights be a memory, detention camps, first for Ma Middle Easterners like the Japanese in World War II, and then for a lot of other people who are not Middle Easterners, big scale, a draft, which will be applauded, maybe with the other measures, by the Democratic leaders who've been saying, we need more troops in, Ar in Iraq. And Bush will say, well, now I agree with you. He can't do it now because he'd be thrown out of office practically. After 9-11, I believe he'll get what he wants. And I believe what he wants is a draft so that he can stay the course in Iraq and possibly go into Iran. An air attack on Iran and uh, various other things like that, a package. So I think we're in the position of the people in Germany in 32 and 33, before the Reichstag fire, when they had a chance to head this off under the Weimar Republic, and they didn't do it. And I'm trying strongly to learn lessons from what they might have done. Frankly, after the Reichstag fire and after what I'm talking about here, if that happens, which could be next month or, I hope, three years from now under a different team, if that happens, there won't be much we can do about it. The place will have been closed down. And the corruptions you're all aware of now will be just furbelows, sort of, on what amounts to an authoritarian state. So I think we're in a very great crisis. I think nothing more is more needed than the example of the people here speaking out and showing that you are patriotic Americans, sensible Americans, that you didn't go crazy before you released the truth, that your current craziness in the way a little 
sleeplessness and neurotic and broken marriages and alcoholism and something is more of a product of what happened after you, uh, you took your step uh, and just part of the price of it and encourage large-scale truth-telling because what the world needs is for us to tell each other the truth about what's going on and for us together to change this world. Thank you. Thank you.